wait for a couple of minutes so that like everyone can join in and then we'll start okay i went i went to i went to get myself a glass of water though in my entire academic career i have never gotten thirsty in the middle of a talk <laughs> the pur- the purpose of a glass of water is to give yourself time to think so if somebody asks you a hard question you say that's a great question hold on one second Does anybody have any more of this? And then, you know, that's just one of the tricks of the trade. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I think that makes two of us. I also have a steel glass here. So. Yeah, well, I mean, I may, I may ask you a very difficult question and you may have to go <laughs> um, to it. <laughs> sure, sure, looking forward to that. Take a longer break. I'll just go to the kitchen and never come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excuse me one second. I just have to... Go to the refrigerator, and then, and then, two hours later, Zoom is over. Um, I got to use this. This is good. This is a good head thing. Yeah, this is. This is. It, is that like? Is this like yes, or is this like kind of yes? This is yes, also, and the, we don't do this. You don't do that. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Okay. You know. You know. I, I say okay. So I'm gonna, I'm, when zooming into India, do as people in India do, so I'll do this, okay. Works. I think this hurts the neck. No, it, it does hurt the neck though. I, one way you can um, avoid that is don't agree with people. <laughs> you know, it's like, just, just be like, so, so like, it's much easier it it at the end of the day my 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 face hurts but uh, but my neck is really in good shape yeah but it also works if you don't want to give an answer you can just do this and you can either you said yes or no no one would know <laughs> right exactly <laughs> or you could just eat just exist <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's eight four. We can just wait for one more minute so that by like eight five, according to Indian time, and then um, we'll begin. Does that work for everyone? Yeah, sure. Now I may tweet. Let me just tweet this out again. Fantastic. Great. So, um, let's begin. Uh, so, um, hello everyone, and thank you so much for coming to this monthly discussion of Loctopus Law School Book Club. I am Umang, and I'm joined by my co-host Sonali. And today we are in conversation with Professor Scott Shapiro, and the person you've come here to listen to. Um, just to give a very brief introduction about Professor Shapiro, he is the Charles F. Southmate Professor of Law and Professor of Philosophy at Yale Law School. He's also authored several books, um, like Legality, which we're going to, which we read in our book club this month, and we are going to discuss with Professor Piro. Apart from that, he's also written books like The Internationalists. He's also the editor of the Oxford Handbook of Jurisprudence and Philosophy of Law, and the editor of Legal Theory and the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. In a lighter vein, he's also a serial tweeter. Some might also label him as a troll, and people on the internet are trying to figure out whether his last couple of tweets were real, or was he just joking? And he also hosts a show called In Lieu of fun show. So we are very excited to be in conversation with Professor Shapiro today, uh, where we will be discussing his philosophy, his books, his writing, or even his tweeting. So thank you so much for joining us today and looking forward to this conversation, Professor Shapiro. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. 
Um, thank you for coming and speaking to us. And we are not going to lie while we have, we claim to read the, have read the book, but uh, we haven't completely understood it. Um, and, but to uh, summarize for those who haven't read the book, uh, Professor Shapiro's argument is based uh, on analytical jurisprudence. And through the book, he reasons against and on behalf of legal philosophers like Hart, Austin, Dworkin, and others. Uh, and he goes on to establish planning theory, which is which like comes basically within the center of the book and almost like drives and drives the entire book also. Um, and it is an understanding to suggest and uh, he's suggesting basically an ontological claim that legal activity can be understood as social planning and legal rules are either plans or plan like norms. Um, he also develops and talks about the concepts like meta interpretative theory and uh, which is also known as disagreement. Uh, theoretical disagreement and uh, counters the understanding of natural law philosophers. Uh, whoever is joining us either on Zoom or on YouTube, please put your questions in the Q&A box in Zoom or comment section uh, or the comment section of the YouTube and we'll take it up. Um, thank you again for coming. Great. So, so let's start with the questions. So, so the first um, set of questions which we have is like the story behind the book. So, Professor Shapiro, can you um, take us through like what was the story behind the book? Like, how did the idea develop, and how did you get to writing the book? Yeah, so um, it's, it's actually, um, I was going to say a good story, but like that's for you to decide, not me. But um, I think it's a good story. So, what happened was, I, I when I started teaching, um, I, I was so. In the United States, for most most places, um, you teach two courses in the fall and two courses in the spring. That's uh, kind of the standard load. And two of my courses, one was jurisprudence, which is a standard juris, you know, you know, from you know Austin, you know, to Dworkin or something like that. Very standard analytical survey. And the second one was this weird course that. Um, that, so my first job was at Cardozo Law School um, in New York, and, and they had this very special course there called Elements of Law. And Elements of Law was like a course that you took in your first semester, first year, and it was like how to think like a lawyer, okay? So you read cases, you read statutes, and you try to teach the students like how to think like a lawyer, and you teach them basic things like holding versus dicta, you'd like teach them actually statutes like the words really do matter in the way that they don't matter with courts and in court and judicial opinions. And it was just, you know, very kind of very standard um, stuff, how to distinguish cases, you know, really basic. So um, what I noticed after like a year of, no, two years of teaching um, elements of law and jurisprudence was that, um, um, what I was saying in one had nothing to do with the other. Like I, what I was saying in jurisprudence had nothing to do with what I was saying about how to think like a lawyer. And that just like, that just seemed like, I was really puzzled by that. Like, why is it the case that um, jurisprudence seems so disconnected from legal practice? Um, and, um, I just started like really trying to kind of wrap my head around why this was the case. So I started thinking like, what is it, what are important kinds of questions that you try to teach first year law students um, about like, what does it mean to think like a lawyer? And are, were there common things there? And was it the case that maybe jurisprudence was leaving those things out. That is not that jurisprudence was irrelevant or that it was unimportant or that it was wrong, um, but rather that there was something missing there. Um, what, and, and I was just really, um, I was really um, perplexed by it. Like you can't teach, like take hearts distinction between core and penumbra or between, you know, kind of the, you know, no vehicles in the park, right? You know, no vehicles in the park, what, you know, like if you, if you drive a car in the park 
well, that falls into the core of vehicle. If you're going to, um, you know, take a book into the park, that's not a vehicle. The book is not a vehicle. Um, and then if you're riding one mower, it, these are all like the game, but like, it's not like, this is not like what I taught the students, um, you know, in elements of law, you know, it was much more complicated than that. Um, and so I was, I just tried to, um, for a couple of years, I mean, I didn't start writing the book till like, what was it about like six, seven years, maybe into teaching. And I was just really trying to like um, connect the two. And so that's how, that's how that came about. Was that a good story? Yeah, see, see, she, I know, before I would have been, before I would have been like, oh, she doesn't think so, but now I'm like, I nailed that. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so like one thing which you're curious about is that you've been teaching uh, legal philosophy for a long time now. You've written also so much on that. So how would you, like looking back, how do you think your, um, like your understanding of the subject and like how you teach it also has evolved over the years? I don't know. <laughs> I'm laughing because um, the only way I've dealt with it is by teaching other things. Um, uh, I don't think it's actually, <laughs> I don't think it's involved at all. Um, uh, I, guess, I guess, you know, so one of the things I put new things on the syllabus every year. So I was really into philosophy of international law. So I put a lot of that on. For a year, I, I was very interested in Carl Schmidt for a while, so I put that on. Um, but I can't say, um, I said, what happened? So this is one of the things that is, I wrote the damn book and I didn't have anything more to say about it. Um, you know, and so when I teach the course, that's like what I teach. Um, uh, and it's, it, it, I would just say it is a, it's a strange feature of my career that I, every year I teach two new courses generally, um, out of, I now teach three courses a year. So I normally teach two new courses every year. And so I'm always, um, uh, so I've like, I think I've taught like 35 different courses in the course uh, over the course of my career. Um, and, um, the way I deal with it is I teach the same course basically, and then I teach new courses, um, um, on different topics, um, in jurisprudence or in legal theory in general. So, um, um, I, I, I think also in part, I did the podcast in a way to put it out there so I don't have to teach it so much. Um, I could teach other things, I think, um. Don't tell anyone I said that, but I think that's what I was doing. Right. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, although a lot of people would, this is in the comment, Nabia uh, said, if don't, ain't broke, don't fix it. Although I, I, you know, I guess that's at issue is whether it's broken or not. Um, thank you for that. Uh, you start the book by asserting that analytical jurisprudence has practical concerns for lawyers as well. And uh, in order to prove conclusively that the law is, I'm just quoting you, in order to prove conclusively that the law is, one must uh, also know a general philosophical truth. Could you explain the relevance of the uh, of understanding legal philosophy through an example? And I would just like to add to that question, I'm not a lawyer. So um, I think... Uh, that also maybe you can cover why non-lawyers should also read legal philosophy if they should. Yeah. So 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 let me say, in part, what I was doing when I um, when when I teach legal philosophy um, um, is I was trying to figure out like what's the right, so, so when they talk to elements of law, I would say, you could read a statute like this, you could read a statute like this, you could read a statute like this. And like students would be like, oh, okay, you write it like this, you write it, read it like this, read it like this. But nobody ever asked like, well, what's the right way to read it? Um, and, and, uh, and in, 
one of the things that was actually particularly interesting to me was that um, the only legal philosopher who I believe um, uh, um, actually addressed the question in a sophisticated way was Ronald Dworkin. Um, Ronald Dworkin um, wanted to know, well, okay, so we have these texts here. We have a constitution, maybe, maybe we have a written constitution, maybe we have a written bill of rights, maybe we have statutes, maybe we have regulations. What's the right way to read these texts? Um, people like Hard, people like Austin, people like Kelson, they had almost nothing interesting to say about interpretation. Um, and I felt like um, uh, I, I, I should have an answer to this question if students were to ask me, well, what's the right way? I mean, that, that was interesting is that like the law students, they, they were just writing things down. Um, um, but like, they should have asked like, what's the right way to do it? Forget like, you could do this, you could do that. Like if your client needs a narrow reading, you can do a narrow reading. If your client needs a broad reading, give a broad reading. What's the right way to do it? Well, that's a kind of like a, that's like a, a perspective that, you know, if you're a lawyer, maybe you don't need so much day to day. But then there's just a, just a general question of like, what's the right thing to do? Um, and it seemed to me that there was no way to know the answer to that question without knowing what law is. Do, do I, do, can, I, can I go on on this for about two more minutes? <laughs> you were going like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. So here we go. Okay. So one way to think about, um, one way to think, I, I talk about this in the book, but I'll just repeat it. So, so like the basic division in legal philosophy is be, between people who think that legal facts are ultimately grounded in social facts, like what people say, do, think, intend. And people who think, and so these are normally called positivists, um, and people who think that the law ultimately is grounded not just by social facts, but moral facts as well. So that means, and they're sometimes called natural lawyers. And so one of the things that was really interesting to me, okay, is that if you're a positivist, the way you're going to figure out what the right way to answer the question about what's the right way to read the law, interpret the law, is going to bottom out in some type of social analysis. Okay, you're not going to do moral philosophy because that's irrelevant to what the law is. It's extremely relevant to what the law ought to be, but it's irrelevant to what the law is. Now, on the other hand, you have this idea, the natural lawyers think that no, law bottoms out in a kind of thick normativity, which we sometimes call, you know, some people call moral facts, some people call objective morality, some people just call morality. And so really what, if you want to figure out what the right way to interpret the law is, you're going to have to do moral philosophy. And these are very different pictures. So when we have debates in the United States, for example, over something called originalism, which is like but the right way to interpret, let's say the, the United States Constitution is according to the original public meaning of the framers. Um, uh, like are, how are we supposed to address that question about whether we want judges like this on the Supreme Court? Are we supposed to make some kind of social analysis that in our legal system, this is the way we do it? Um, or are we supposed to engage in some kind of thick normative theorizing about no originalism is morally better and because it's morally better, it's legally better. Um, and um, gosh, I don't see how you could possibly answer that question without doing philosophy. Now, it turns out that most legal questions can be answered by Google. I mean, that's just like, I, I, that's why I said conclusively no. I mean, that's how, that's how almost everything is answered nowadays. You want a question? Yeah, somebody has a question, you just type it into Google. But like when you're getting to more sophisticated, more challenging, more intricate 
types of questions, then, you know, obviously a search engine is not going to work. You're not going to have to engage in um, more analysis. And the claim in the book is that um, at the end of the day, you're going to have to ask answer the question, what is law? Because that's going to be the only way you're going to be able to figure out what the law is. So the way I put it is what, what the law is depends on what law is. Is law ultimately grounded in social facts or in moral facts as well? Now, why should non-lawyers care about it? Well, like, I mean, for, you know, one of the things that's amazing is that, um, you know, the law is maybe the most, I mean, next to language, maybe, and um, maybe the next to language, it's the most sophisticated thing that human beings have constructed in their social world. Um, and it, it determines practically every aspect of our lives. Um, and if you're just like interested in the world um, uh, and interested in like what happens in the news and what happens um, like, you know, should um, women have the right to terminate their pregnancies? Um, should the legislature have the power to um, impose privacy constraints? Do so, you know, what are the constraints on content moderation? On, um, on social media from the perspective of the state. These are all questions that are not only legal questions, but they're also deeply um, philosophical questions. And I, I'm, I, 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 you know, not that non-lawyers have to be interested in it because there's lots of interesting things in the world. Um, it's just, it, this is among the very interesting things. And, you know, um, it, it's cool if people who are not particularly interested in a, sub in a subject can be drawn into it. And that's what I was trying to do with the book. And I failed. I don't think you failed. Um, I think uh, it was uh, a difficult book and uh, only because we haven't read enough. And that's why uh, it was harder for us um, and uh, at the time of one question that I had is that at the time of reading your book, uh, while we thought that we understood parts, like while I was reading, I thought I was understanding it. And the moment I left it or went on to the other chapter, I forgot what I had read before. It could also be uh, just my brain fog. But I think that usually happens with me and especially during philosophy. And that's probably the conundrum with philosophy. When do you know that you have understood the concept? And how much time or years did it take you to understand Dworkin, Austin, Gellin, Hart, and uh, the other half of the, of the book you also cover, Waldron, et cetera. And so, I mean, yes, I mean, it took me, I read Hart and I've read like, I've tried to read Derrida, et cetera, to understand something, but I just have always missed it. So I just want, I just want to say that the big problem with philosophy is you never know whether it's you or the or the ideas that is like sometimes you like i mean i had this thing I, I would have this you know it was a pervasive feeling as an undergraduate like i had no idea whether i was dumb um or just these were hard concepts um uh and um and it's also in the nature of philosophy which is that you're writing in a way that's, so one of the things that philosophy is doing, it, so John Campbell, uh, a philosopher of mind um, at, at the University of California, Berkeley, has this great expression that philosophy is thinking in slow motion. And the, we're not trained to break down everything we say and think into premises because, um, well, you know, it's exhausting to do that. Um, and you would never get anywhere in conversation. That's why, like, it's so irritating to talk to philosophical friends um, because you'd say, like, what do you, I mean, what do you want for lunch today? And they'll say, what do you mean lunch? 
You know, I mean, it's um, it's one of those things where it's very um, irritating, I think, to um, interrogate everything you're saying. Um, and we, off, we, we don't have a good language for doing that. Um, and so it's perfectly understandable um, when, when I try to tell students is like, yeah, I can't read philosophy. I mean, this is, a, this is the, I didn't make, so um, who said it? Somebody said, famously said, you can't read Ulysses, James Joyce's Ulysses, you can only reread it. And I think the same thing is true about philosophy in general. Like most of the time to read something one time, you just have a no idea what, the, what they're talking about. I have read the concept of law, I don't know, at least 50 times, at least five zero. Um, and I always learn more things from it. Uh, actually, Hilary Putnam famously said, the mark of a philosophical classic is the more you read it, um, Oh, God, now I forget now, how embarrassing. The mark of philosophical classic is this, the smarter you become, the smarter it becomes. Um, that's, that's how it goes. The smarter you become, the smarter it becomes. And that's the idea is that like, it's one of those things where you have to like build up um, a, um, a, a set of understandings. Um, it's like, you know, when you do a jigsaw puzzle, you know, you have to get the border right first before you can do the interior things. And philosophy is a lot like that. But in other cases, um, philosophers are just bad writers. Um, and so it's, it's not you, it's them. So, um, uh, I, I, you know, it, it, what, you're, what, you're ex what you're expressing about um, philosophy is, a, is one of the things that makes philosophy really fun to teach. Wow. And um, so because like you're talking about that uh, philosophy often like takes a lot of like time to for you to like develop your own thinking. And because like you've been teaching also for so long in your experience, like how, sh how should you um, like, how would you tell students to approach um, this subject? Because um, like, as we understood later, probably like reading books cover to cover is not like the best way of understanding things maybe. And then like while listening to your podcast also, I saw that you have a reading list, which like take some chapters from your book of legality and some other uh, like books by like Hart and Dworkin. So in that, like, how do you suggest students like develop their own understanding of legal philosophy? Well, first of all, like, let's not forget that it's not like students think, oh, let me learn legal philosophy. Like you take, you know, like you take a course in it and basically you're gonna do what your teacher assigns. So in some sense, like you don't really have any <laughs> autonomy in these, in these matters. You just like, I mean, you can go off and read whatever you want to read, but it's not going to particularly help you in your jurisprudence class. Um, so I, 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 I don't, I really am a firm believer in follow what your teacher is, is doing. Also, jurisprudence is a, is a capacious subject there's a lot to and the, the things that I do are you know in a way it means very mainstream stuff but it's very anglophone um centered it's very not European it's very not um uh you know um third world um it's very um uh what's the word um uh it's just very particular um, and there's a, it's a big subject. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, people are going to teach a lot now is critical race theory. And they're going to teach critical race theory because it's become a big issue in the United States. Um, you have all the, the, the one political party is trying to outlaw the teaching of critical race theory. So people are going to start to teach critical race theory. That's going to, that's actually going to be very, um, um, that's actually going to be a really good thing in the long run, because it will, it will force um, uh, jurisprudence teachers to teach critical race theory because it's become an issue. 
Um, and um, I believe it will truly backfire. Um, this, you know, the uh, raising critical race theory um, uh, to something that seems dangerous. Uh, now people will want to know what it is. Um, and I think uh, syllabi will change. Um, and so <laughs> I would say to students, like, how should you learn jurisprudence? Re you know, read the, as we say, read the damn syllabus. Read, re read what your teacher tells you to read, first of all, because like you're going to take an exam in it. Um, and that's super duper important. But there are many, there's, aside from analytical jurisprudence, there's a whole other topic of normative jurisprudence, like, you know, what's the justification for punishment? Why, why keep your contracts? Why, why are you responsible in tort for comp compensating people for your wrongs? Just all that. And then there's feminism, there's critical race theory, there's critical legal studies. There's a, there's, it's just a big subject. And so, um, uh, you know, what I'm doing is a kind of very particular. Yeah, um, and another thing which we're interested in is like, how would you say your, um, like your career has been in terms of like publishing about like philosophy? Because like one thing is uh, because people find like philosophy to be something which is not so accessible. Uh, I think that also translates to lesser people like writing and publishing about it because they feel that they don't know enough about the subject. And um, like while also like listening to your podcast, I remember you telling about like one paper which you would publish, which was slightly like later after you graduating, but that like helped you get um, like recognized. So, so in that, like, um, is there anything which you'd want to like tell academics also who have joined this call in terms of like how they should look to like legal publishing or like just forming their own thoughts so that they can pursue a career in this field if they want to? Yeah, so, I mean, um, so jurisprudence, it's a very good thing that it has become, I mean, it's a mixed, it's a mixed story. So on the one hand, jurisprudence has become a very professionalized subject. Um, and in order to do it, I shouldn't say in order to do it, it's extraordinarily helpful to have a strong philosophical background. Generally, that means at the professional level, having a PhD in philosophy. Now, one does not need a PhD in philosophy to do jurisprudence. I want to be really clear about that. One does not, but it really helps. Um, and generally what will happen is that at least in the United States or in the, let me just say in the Anglophone world, um, what will happen is you will, you'll do a law degree and then you'll do a PhD in philosophy which will typically not be about jurisprudence. It'll be philosophy of language, it'll be metaphysics, it'll be decision theory, it'll be something. And then you'll tack on one last chapter about the law. Um, and one of the things that I spend an enormous amount of time with my students doing is marketing. That is trying to figure out how to take your philosophical ideas and make them interesting to lawyers, okay? Now this may seem like a strange thing to do, but it is a kind of like a condition of getting a job. So you could be the best legal philosopher in the world, but if you can't express your ideas in ways that law professors who don't do jurisprudence are interested in, you're not gonna get the job. Also, um, you know, if you wanna, so we have two tracks in the United States um, and in, in other countries, the same thing. We, we have peer review journals, things like Oxford Journal of Legal Studies, Legal Theory, Law and Philosophy. There's a whole set of professional peer review journals, but then there's these things, of course, called law reviews, and they are picked up by students, by law students. So if you're gonna write um, a legal philosophy thing for a law review, you're gonna have to write it in a completely different way than if you do it for um, for peer review, okay? So not only do you have to take your ideas and make them relevant for law professors in order to get your job, 
You also have to figure out how to make your ideas relevant so you can publish it like your ideas in law reviews, because you're not just trying to appeal to law professors, but also to law students. Um, and that's very difficult because they really don't um, find jurisprudence interesting. Um, so it's a really, what most people do, I think, is if they're writing something that's really, you know, basic legal philosophy that they can't like flip um, to something that um, is like a topical issue for legal academics or law students, they'll publish, they'll, they'll submit it to a, um, a peer reviewed journal. So it really, it's so much of academic publishing is marketing. Um, one of the things I always tell students is you lose your, you get, you lose your audience in the first two paragraphs. Um, you know, you, the first two paragraphs are, are critical. If people are bored or don't understand the first two paragraphs, they will just put it away. Um, and so one of the things I try so hard with students, and it's a very difficult thing to do, is how to um, uh, shape their ideas in ways which are relevant to maybe not legal practitioners, but legal academics. Thank you for answering that. Um, actually, uh, we had two questions in mind. I had two questions in mind while you were talking about, uh, before also when you were talking about social fact and moral fact. And I also had a question just now when you were talking about writing the two first two paragraphs. We also run like a writer's club where we try to write and it's almost like a virtual writing Zoom. And uh, there we talk about how to write and the processes, et cetera. And we sort of intellectual, intellectual, uh, we sort of intellectualize it so that we don't have to uh, write. Um, uh, so this question is premised upon the very little knowledge that I have of jurisprudence. Uh, for instance, uh, Austin's theory was refuted by Hart. Then Hart's theory was refuted by Dworkin. And then Dworkin's theory was again refuted by many people, including Marshall Cohen, etc. cetera. Um, when you were writing this book, were you writing that purposely, that keeping that in mind? Because the starting of the book is almost like a premise and then the response to that premise. For instance, you explain and then you respond and the introduction is also written in a way that even if i'm not um from a legal professional let's say i'm not a legal professional then i can actually indulge in that uh so uh two questions two part questions this is in is, like did you plan the book in that way or did it automatically happen that uh, sort of it gradually goes towards planning theory which is the central point of the book and the second part is the structure um did it come before or did it come after or uh, as in because yeah. I observe that the book increasingly becomes difficult um as it goes for me yes yeah, so, yeah no of course i mean you know one thing people don't realize is that just as it becomes harder to understand the book the longer you go into it it's it, it's it, it's that much harder to write the book as you go along um so so a 500 page book is not like writing 10, 50 page papers. You know, it's not linear, it's exponential. Um, so that's the first thing. But I'll just tell you, I, the structure of the book, I just tried to copy Hart, the concept of law. So I try, I mean, my, I, I really did. I, so, so like he, what's so amazing about the concept of law other than the fact that it's amazing um, is that what he, what what Hart did is he made so he if you look at the preface he said that he was trying to write this book for undergrads um, and it made me think oh wait a second like why can't I like write I mean I could I mean, not that I would succeed but I could try to write the concept of law fifty years on but in, in the way that he did it. So what you, what you want to do is you want to write a good third of the book um, where students are actually learning things um, that, um, that have nothing to do with what you think so that they could treat it as like a, like a, 
like a treatise or something that they can, or like a study aid. And that kind of sucks them in. So, and then you go, blammo, you hit them with your theory. Okay. And so that's what I was trying to do. I was like trying to like, so, when, you know, Austin, most people are kind of understand Austin, but hard, hard to understand. And Dworkin is hard to understand. And so I thought, like, what if I could write a book that you could read and understand what these people were saying? And then I, then I gotcha. And then I can um, um, put out my own theory. So, for example, if I had written a book that was just about the planning theory of law, you know, specialists would read it. Um, you know, but like law students wouldn't read it because it would just be one more theory, um, you know, but here law students read it in large part because it's a, it's expository. Um, and once, once you hook them, then you can slip in your stuff. And that was the idea behind it. And then the last third of the book was an attempt to try to just explain, I mean, really the last third of the book was like me working out what would I tell law students how to think like a lawyer from a jurisprudential point of view. So one of the things I learned in, when I first started teaching is that questions of trust are really important. So you'll say to students, well, like when we figure out how should we interpret the law, we're going to ask questions like, do we trust judges? Do we, what's the relationship between the legislature and the judiciary? What's the relationship between the executive branch and the legislative branch? Like what, it, what is the kind of the nature of the cooperative relationship? How much are they agreeing and disagreeing? How much do they trust each other? How much don't they trust each other? And then I thought, well, you want a theory that can help explain why these are questions that we naturally gravitate towards. And I felt like Austin, Kelson, Hart, Dworkin failed utterly in trying to explain why questions of trust and institutional competence matter so much to lawyers. And so the planning theory was my attempt to try to explain why trust matters so much in interpretation because trust matters so much in planning. That was what I tried to do. So that was the idea. So the first third was like, oh, you can learn something from this book. The next third was like, oh, here's a new theory. Well, I just already read a third of it. I might as well read a little bit more. Um, and then the last one would be payoff. Like, okay, this is, this is how you should interpret the law, or this is how you should think about interpreting the law. So that was the structure of the book. But there's no question it becomes harder to understand as you go along, because everything is supposed to build on everything else. And, um, uh, and like repetition after a while becomes really tedious. So, you know, it's, you know, I don't blame you for having a more difficult time the more you read it. I mean, it's, it's, it's just harder. Yeah, and um, adding on to that, we were wondering that firstly, like what is your writing process like in the sense, like a lot of people plan everything from beforehand, research a lot, then start writing. Some people like write while they're researching. That's the first part. And the second is that is the writing process like different when you're writing, um, a book which is more towards a general audience, say like internationalists, which is which is more non-academic than what legality is. So did you find your writing process to also become different when you were writing oh, yeah. these books? Oh yeah, they were unbelievably different. And so so when I, when I, when I was a graduate student, I remember I was I was uh, in a flat um, in Oxford. Um, I didn't remember, I mean, I remember part of my dissertation in Oxford. Um, and he was also a graduate student, but he was in the English literature. And he walks down, and I'm sitting on the couch, um, typing on a laptop. And he says to me, what are you doing? Um, by the way, this was before the internet. So like, there, like, you wouldn't just be on your laptop unless you were working, right? Um, and so he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, I I'm, I'm working. He's like, doing what? I said, writing my dissertation. He goes, where are your books? And I go, there are no books. Like, you don't, like in philosophy, there, just, there are no books. You just, I mean, every once in a while you need a book to get the quote, but it's not really a, it's not a, a, like 
a big research pro, uh, project. Um, it's really like an armchair thing where you like kind of sweat out everything um, and you're not really using that many sources. When the internationalists, we had 130 pages of endnotes. Um, uh, so like it was so unbelievably, uh, um, um, it was very thickly researched. Um, and I have this, I have the most, I, I believe that I have the most inefficient way of writing known to man, known to Scott. I think I've almost invented um, uh, a new form of scholarly writing. Um, um, in, in, in its beautiful and its inefficiency. So what I do is um, when there's um, uh, text, like, so what happens now is like, I, I wrote a book on cybersecurity. So I do my research and then I write stuff. Um, and lots of times I won't even, I just make stuff up. I never cite, I never cite, I make stuff up. I, I haven't read the article. I kind of guess what it says. Um, it's really foolish. So I write it, I finish it, and I feel really good. But of course, it's stupid because like I made up a lot of it. So then I go back and then I start actually reading the article to see whether what I guessed was right. <laughs> and sometimes like I'll just, I, I mean, almost everything I do from memory, um, I don't take notes. Um, and so I'll have to go back and I'll have to reread the stuff in order to figure out whether the site, what, you know, what the citation is. So it's, I mean, I hope you can get the flavor of how ridiculous this is. Um, uh, and so it takes me much longer to write things than um, a rational agent. Um, uh, but I just, you know, part of the thing is writing is so awful, such an awful experience. Um, I really, I really hate it. Um, nothing I hate more than writing. Um, actually, there's only one thing I hate more than writing, and that's not writing. Um, uh, you know, that, that, that's that feeling of self-loathing. Um, for so I, so during the pandemic, I wrote an entire book, and it was just a terrible, terrible experience. Like, I just stare at the computer. And I would just make sure to write one page a day, like one good page a day. And at the end of 365 days, you get a book. Um, um, but it's just, it's just like, it's a terrible experience. I hate it. Um, um, and yet that's what I do every goddamn day. Like I work on weekends. Um, uh, I no longer can work at nights. I used to, now I do, I mean, I think it's like a pandemic thing, but I now work from like nine to five, whereas I, oh, like I never did that. I would work nine to midnight, like nine in the morning to midnight every day. Um, and now I can't do it. Um, just, um, uh, well, just cause like I'm older. So. Oh, but can I say one other thing? Um, there's a huge difference between um, there's another, um, 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 the, 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 what, when you write, um, an academic, uh, book or article, it's a completely different process than writing a trade book. Um, so this is the, you want to know the difference between academic writing and trade writing for general audience is almost this. Okay. In academic writing, you start with the theory, then you use example, you use narrative as examples. It's the other way around. You start with the story in trade writing, and then you try to derive from that interesting things. And so what happens is, is that um, uh, in academic writing, because the examples are just trying to prove your thesis, you kind of take out all the adjectives, all the things that are extraneous. Whereas when you're writing trade stuff, like it's really important was, was he wearing a yellow shirt? Like in philosophy, it doesn't matter if somebody's wearing a yellow shirt, unless you have a stupid hypothetical about discrimination against ye yellow shirt people. But like, it really matters like when writing a story, like to tell people like what the color of the shirt was. So it's really kind of fun 
like trying to figure out like what the color, what that guy's shirt's color was. So it, it has a kind of like a, a really different quality to it. And then also you try to be, I at least try to be funny when I write um, narrative, um, whereas I don't, try, I obviously can't do that in academic writing. So it's kind of, um, and when I, when I write narrative, I try to use my Twitter voice, by which I mean, like, not just like, try to be funny, like I, emphasis on try, um, but also like one of the things that Twitter really teaches you to do is use few words. And that is in some sense, the biggest mistake that um, academics make when they write. They use too many goddamn words. Um, you know, like a sentence, you know, with 30 words is so much harder to understand than a sentence with 15 words. And generally the sentence with 15 words will be clearer. Um, and so um, uh, I think actually social media has taught me to be unbelievably parsimonious with my language. Um, and I think that's helped my writing enormously. Thank you. So we had a question where we were wondering that uh, in uh, lieu of fun, you had said that philosophers are gentle trollers. So they basically ask about uh, ask about questions which are basically very general and then philosophize them for no reason. Um, uh, you are on Twitter and uh, are you on Twitter because you are a philosopher or are you a philosopher because you are on Twitter? Yeah. <laughs> Also, uh, now that we know that you're a writer because you're on Twitter and perhaps vice versa. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I, I, so, um, uh, I, so why did I go on Twitter? So, I like, so the, the funny, it's actually really, really funny to me that like I become so public because like before I ever went on Twitter, like I was the, I was super private person really private and people um i remember you know brian leiter has a has, has a philosophy blog um uh, and he would always say to me why don't you guest blog why don't you guest blog why don't you guest blog and i would say no 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 I, i'm a very private person i couldn't possibly um do this um and then you know you know 15 years later um you know i i i've become a twitter troll um, why did I join it? I, I joined Twitter um, in, in large part because I was coming out with the trade book, The Internationalist, and like, that's what you're supposed to do. Like publicists tell you, you go on Twitter. And I actually didn't even know what the point of Twitter was for so long. I, like, I, just, I experimented with so many different styles and so many things until I realized that like the point of Twitter for me was if something popped into my head and I thought was funny, I would just tweet it out. And this is, this was like early on, I think it was like maybe a year into my being on Twitter. So one of the things that you don't, you, like when you're first on Twitter, you have absolutely no idea, like whether you're doing it right, whether it's successful or not. I mean, it's just really hard. You, you just basically are, you know, typing words into a void um, and you just don't know. And one day I was walking back to my apartment and a bird flew and went bash into um, into a, into a store window and like went bam and then fell to the ground. I thought, damn, I feel like that bird. And then I thought that would be a funny thing to tweet. And then I just went, you know, I just saw a bird in it. God, oh, I feel like them. And people are like, oh, that's really funny. I feel that way too. I thought, oh, okay, I am going to. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. If I think it's funny, don't think about it. Just tweet it out. So like. Um, I feel like the two philosophy and Twitter have two things in common. No, they have one thing in common, which are two things. Um, there are two things and they have something in common, sorry. Um, I feel like philosophy is all about like being confused. Like what the hell is going on? Like, how do I know that this chair exists? Um, everyone seems so sure that the external world exists. How do they know? Or like, 
you really shouldn't do that. It's wrong. Like, is it wrong? Like, isn't it wrong? I don't know. How do you know that? Or, you know, philosophy, you know, like, you know, you should be an originalist. Um, um, and you're like, why? So I feel like there's this like reality testing constantly going on, like constant sense of confusion. Like, why are you so sure that, wh wh like, how can you go through your life acting like the external world exists? Um, like, doesn't that bother you? So I feel like that's the same thing about Twitter. It's like, I feel like people are saying stupid things. Do, do other people think they're stupid? Um, like, how do you make sense of like the fact that the president, uh, you know, of, of the last four years, the president of the United States is a lunatic. Like, what do we think about that? I feel like this, this sense of constantly reaching out for um, uh, um, explanations. Can somebody please explain to me how this is possibly going on? Um, so I feel like the two things are very connected. Um, and I had this rule, I had to adjust it a little bit just because it was causing a little bit too much um, activity, but I had this rule that I would never, I would just tweet something out as soon as I thought it. Now I give it a little bit more thought just because like when you get into like the blow ups, you know, I don't want to get canceled. Um, so I think about it a little bit more. But I mean, Socrates was the biggest troll in the world. You know, I mean, there was no bigger troll than Socrates. Um, and so, you know, one has to model oneself after somebody, so. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great standard to have. Um, <laughs> right, so right, I, right. <laughs> right, so I meant about the as tro as trolling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, you often see these things on Twitter, right? If this person were alive, they would be the biggest Twitter celebrity today. Lots of people like do those kind of things. So, so yeah, like I'm sure, uh, like if Socrates was alive, he'd be a big Twitter star. Oh no, I, absolutely. I mean, it's a fun game actually to play. Who would be good on what philosophers would be good on Twitter? So, like, you might think Wittgenstein would be good on Twitter, right? Because he wrote like in these tweet things, but he's too brittle. Like, you can't like he block everyone. You know, and then he would then he would delete his account and then he'd start his account two years later with a different name. And, you know, he'd, he'd be irritating as hell. Um, you know, um, Spinoza, I think, would be great. Um, you know, I think I think, um, you know, Bertrand Russell would be really good for the normies. You know, he would say like normal things and they would really like him. Um, you know, uh, it's a fun game to play, you know, like who'd be, who'd be good and who'd be bad on Twitter. But I, 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 I firmly believe that Wittgenstein would be a nightmare. I just want to add, yep. I think Aristotle will be really nice because just anonymity. And then, and then you can say that Plato said all those things and. I don't know. <laughs> right. He, he, uh, uh, I mean, the question is like, did Plato use Socrates as a sock puppet? You, you know what a sock puppet is? You know, it's like a, um, a, a false, uh, a false identity to kind of be your mouthpiece. So um, it, I, 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 you know, Socrates might have been Plato's sock puppet. Yeah, yeah, this brings us to like one question which we had. Um, so we were wondering that whenever somebody reads philosophy, they're always reading people who are um, like who've written books a very long back, um, which is and usually like when you're reading say about tech and all, it's usually forward looking people versus if you're reading about philosophy, it's people who've written books in the 18th, 19th, 20th century. So, um, so why is that? Do you think that people tend to give more emphasis to like philosophers who aren't there anymore right now? And that's why, um, like you think what they've written is like the biggest text for you to interpret. That's one thing. And the second is like, because of like these social media companies or like generally so many more companies coming up now, which are um, in a way replacing state function also. So you think that also changes the nature of like law and like how you think about the law or you think the nature of law remains the same, but um, like these forms of governments may come and go. So, so two parts to that. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm miss, I, I understood the second part. Can you please repeat the first part? Because 
we, uh, the Zoom went out a little bit during part of it. Yeah, so in the, f- the first part you're wondering is whenever you're reading about philosophy or reading about like authors who've written about things like way long back. So why do you think that is the case? Is it because like these texts are actually that more, that much more important or is it because usually um, like some people you. say we tend to give like more emphasis to people who are not there right now, sort of like viewing the past in a like sepia tinted way. So you think th- yeah. is this what happens with like yeah. philosophy? So I was just say there's a big debate, by the way, um, it's very contentious in some American philosophy departments, I'm sure it's true in other philosophy departments in other countries, um, just out of the American situation, I know better, but there's a huge debate between people, um, uh, between people who do history philosophy and people who do contemporary philosophy. The contemporary philosophy people think it's it, 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 it not, I mean, I'm really simplifying here. So, you know, I'm drawing, uh, you know, caricatures, but, you know, they're, they're it's, it's, it's a good approximation, okay? So the contemporary philosophy people think, what, why are we reading wrong people? You know, like, like, let's read the best that we have and, you know, the most up-to-date stuff and the most up-to-date stuff is the contemporary stuff. Um, whereas the history philosophy people um, think two things. Um, they think that, like the history of the subject is incredibly important to understand where, how we got to where we got. And the second thing, and I think this is something that I had not appreciated until I wrote, um, I worked on the internationalists um, uh, with, with my colleague on Hathaway, um, which was that like Grotius, like, you know, why would you read Grotius? Like you might read Grotius because you, yeah, like wanna like learn where certain ideas came from. But it actually turns out he was really smart. And it turns out that like these people, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Kant, Mill, Smith, you know, Plato, Aristotle, you know, you know, and and you know, this is the tradition that the Western tradition that I know, it's true in other traditions, they just were really super intelligent people. And you actually learn an enormous amount about the subject you're interested in by reading them, even though they were, they may be wrong, they were wrong in such interesting ways. Um, so it's, it's, it's an interesting feature of, um, of uh, old texts is that they often fulfill a dual function. On the one hand, they play a genetic role you understand where, how we got the ideas that we got to by reading what they did. And so therefore you kind of can't help but read old texts, right? Because it's a genetic inquiry, but also they're just, gosh, they were really smart. And you can learn an enormous amount from puzzling through their texts about the subject that you're really interested in. That having been said, like I said, there's a big debate um, and it's quite contentious when it comes to hiring. Um, and so like, you know, cause there's going to be a question, do we hire in contemporary or do we hire in history? Um, and that, 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 and so that's, that's when the stakes become real because when you have scarcity, then people have to make the choices that really truly reveal their preferences. So that's, that, that's what I would say. And the second thing about the, you know, the, uh, the social media companies, you know, um, what is, um, you know, they have acquired um, an enormous amount of power, Um, uh, obviously in the last, well, how long has it been? 10 years? Yeah, 10 years. um, Yeah, 10 years, a little over a decade. But like, you know, I think people exaggerate their power in the following sense that like the United States government could just end Facebook and Twitter by just making it illegal. I mean, it just, they could just do it. I mean, it'd be unpopular um, and it would, you know, the money to the Democratic Party and the Republican Party would dry up from tech companies. Um, But like the thing about cyberspace 
is that it supervenes on physical space. That is, that you can't have a change in physical in cyberspace without there being a change in physical space. And it is a feature of the state that they control the physical space. And because they control the physical space, they control cyberspace and they could end everything. Um, so like this idea that Facebook is like a new kind of state, I think is just incredible. I mean, it's noticing something that's really interesting which is that A, they're super powerful. Number two, they are doing, they are performing a state-like function in controlling the flow of information, which is traditionally a state function. Number three, they are developing adjudicative um, uh, um, mechanisms through co about you know, content moderation and all that stuff. And you know, with Facebook and the Oversight Board, they're developing a jurisprudence about content moderation. Um, but come on, you know, they they need they need electricity. You know, deny them electricity, and like they're gone. Block their IP addresses and stuff like that. Um, I mean, you know, like China. You know, I mean, that's you know they. You know, nobody thinks that Alibaba is um, is you know on par with the Chinese state. It just isn't. It just so happens that um, in in democratic countries um, uh, and liberal countries, uh, the state doesn't want to exert that kind of power, but they could. Actually, we sort of, I think we agree because we come from India and we have been having these issues with intimidatories and uh, Twitter and WhatsApp going against or probably just suing the government and back and forth. Um, and that has been the case. And probably when they agree with the government, they are, they are like an extension to the government, but probably not a state entity itself. It could be yeah. that. Uh, um, right. My, right. Yeah. I mean, you could say that about Amazon like amazon.com i mean like you know it's not i mean they performed an enormous logistical i mean whatever you want to think about amazon and i'm not a I, i'm like a super non-fan of amazon though i use <laughs> i use them um uh you know like they were enormously important during the pandemic and performed a lot of kind of state functions of of distributing goods uh, and food. Um, they're not the state. Um, uh, and uh, uh, um, I think people get carried away um, when they notice that you have a very powerful new entity. People want to say, oh, it's like the state. It's like the state in some ways, but it's not the state. Um, I just wanted to ask you one question. Earlier, you said that you were basically mimicking heart and while writing the book. Uh, I don't know, like, I don't remember the concept of law very well. I read it back in college. Um, so then I sort of thought that uh, for Dworkin, at least, I felt that he refers more to political controversies than heart in the book. And also, like, when you're proceeding towards the heart uh, Dworkin chapters, you're talking about American Revolution, the idea of separation of state, and where the I think the planning theory really comes in, I sort of understood through that chapter, where you actually say that this is basically they're trying to mitigate any circumstances, and um, if they may arise. Uh, so, um, in a reply to Mark, Marshall Cohen, this is where I think we get really fiery. Wait, wait, I'm sorry, we I'm trying to uh, oh, oppose... Uh, oh. I'm, I'm sorry, the, la the last sentence got cut off from Zoom. Can you repeat it, please? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think here uh, probably you won't agree with me because whatever I've read about the book from uh, other pieces, uh, they have basically said that, uh, you know, this is not possible and you're trying uh, to be like, you're also like basing your argument in the moral purpose argument, which is also a Bra's argument, sort of uh, as in mimics Ra's argument. Um, uh, in a reply to Marshall Cohen, uh, Dworkin had said that any theory of law is based on some particular uh, normative theory. 
So if the same is used to counter, um, you know, the planning theory, how would you rebut it? And uh, do you think in justifying or taking sides, you're also making normative claims, which is essentially what Dawkins believed in? I'm sorry, are you, are, are, are you saying, are you asking me, like, why do I think I'm right and Dworkin's wrong? Is, is, that the, is that the question or is it? I, I, I think for you, the statement, plus that's a question. Uh, so, uh, I mean, Dworkin had said that any theory of law, when he was right. applying to uh, uh, Cohen, that any theory of law is based on particular normative theory. So when, while you're justifying and while you're taking sides of the law, are you making normative cl claims? And then do you think that uh, uh, Dworkin is right in saying what he said? And do you think but, it's a good criticism? Right, right. so, so it's, it's, this is a really important question um, um, because it really kind of goes to like the center of like what we're doing when we're arguing about legal philosophy. So Dworkin thinks like, how are you possibly going to answer? So here's Hart. Hart's like, the rule of recognition is a practice among officials um, uh, to do certain things, um, to apply certain rules um, under certain circumstances. And so you want to know what the law is, see what they do. And then Dworkin says, but you can't do that because they disagree with each other. And yet they still need to come up with an answer. What could possibly be the thing that they're relying upon except for a normative theory? Like you kind of run out of stuff to talk about. Like if you think that the law rests on social facts alone, then you're like run out of things to talk about if people are disagreeing with each other because they don't, the social facts that Hart claims exists actually doesn't exist. Um, and so lots of, lots of positivists have said, well, you know, there's a, lot of there's a lot of kabuki in law. Like I pretend this and you pretend that and we go through this whole kind of elaborate thing and we all know it's theater. And so that's what happens in, in a lot of these things. And, Dworkin, I think, rightly kind of says that that turns law into a kind of a joke. Um, it turns it into like, at the end of the day, it's just a bunch of fakery. Um, and, I, and, I, and I actually, I think he's right about that. Um, and so one of the things I try to do is try to, given given so how, how, you know what i love about philosophy is that like how are you supposed to answer a question like this like where where do you even start like where's the handle so one of the things that i try to do is try to think there is another kind of setting where we wonder about what it is that we're supposed to do and we don't engage in normative theorizing, and that's planning. So let's say, I, so we had a plan to, to, to meet at eight o'clock India standard time to talk about the, the stuff, right? So like when I decided like, what do I do when I got up in the morning? I didn't, I didn't like use a normative theory to determine whether I should talk to you um, at, at, at 8 p.m. because it's already been settled. That's why I, we already made a plan about it. If you were to, if I were to say to myself, well, in order to know what I planned, I have to have a normative theory about what I should have planned, then the plan's not doing any work. And so the thought is, is that the way law works is that it tries to answer questions in the right way, normative questions in the right way. And the way that it works is it guides people by preempting them from actually going through the very thought process that the law is supposed to make irrelevant, okay? And so I feel like when Dworkin says all law ultimately bottoms out in a normative theory, I said, would you say that about plans? Would you say like, 
what I plan to do ultimately depends on an arm of fear. You'd say, no, of course not. That's not, the plans are exactly work in the opposite way. You have a normative theory that, that develop, which leads to you to adopt a plan. If you then refer back to that normative theory, you're undoing what the plan is doing. And plans are not the only thing. There's projects, there's intentions, there's, there's, core, there's social planning. There's lots of things. But I mean, planning is something that we do, you know, you know, hundreds of times a day. I mean, we're so good at it. Um, and I just think that law is just a much bigger, sophisticated form of that planning. And if, and so the response to Dworkin is that actually um, uh, legal theory can't rest on the normative theory or else it would be undoing exactly what it's supposed to do. I actually had a follow up uh, to this. I don't know if my internet is really feeble. Just let me know if you can't hear me. Um, no, I, I can. I can hear you. Just some every once in a while it breaks up. Okay, okay. Uh, so um, you have drawn a distinction between legal reasoning and judicial decision making while you were talking about the TVA versus Hill uh, case, which you take from Dworkin. And you establish that while Powell and uh, Berger, they are just discussing or probably just have in, uh, questions that they're trying to solve in that particular case, they are actually making a judicial decision. Instead, they are not they are not uh, arguing on the very basis of the moral of law. They're, so you try you see that uh, Dworkin is basically unsettling, which is already settled, is something that sort of sticks with me. But however. Whenever I read of uh, I read David uh, Dyson to understand uh, whatever you have said, and I've read other uh, people who have sort of responded to your uh, piece and book, they said that you are conflating the two. Uh, and this is one of the critiques that I read again and again that you were conflating and you didn't understand Walken well. Um, so how do you? Sorry, oh, I'm sorry. Well, well, I mean, just so I mean, because people have accused me of conflating lots of things. So um, I, I need to just narrow down which which conflation are you referring to right now? Judicial decision making versus legal reasoning. Oh, oh, okay, right, right, okay. So, so, so there's a yeah. So um, I make a distinction um uh in the book i mean I, I, it's not my distinction um it, it i mean it's my words um but it's not my distinction i think that this i mean it's just hearts distinction um the basic idea was is that legal reasoning is trying to figure out what the law is um judicial decision making is deciding a case okay now th those two things can come apart because um, uh, you ran out of law. So there's no more law to find, but you still have to decide the case. So judicial decision-making often, uh, you know, judicial often relies on non-legal considerations because the law has run out. Now, I feel, I, I didn't, I didn't, that's not my distinction. That's Hart's distinction. Um, uh, and uh, Dworkin thinks that that's, Dworkin thinks that that, it's not that Dworkin thinks that's a conflation, he thinks that the distinction is illusory. That is, um, uh, he thinks that all ju judicial decision-making is legal reasoning, okay? He thinks that any time that the judge decides a case, they're deciding it according to law. And his evidence for that is that if you've ever read a judicial decision, it never reads like Hart says it reads. Like Hart says, um, you know, you figure out what the law is, sometimes the law runs out, then you extend the law. Judges never say that. They never say, we've run out of law, therefore I'm gonna choose what I think is best. Like that never, I mean, I've, it almost never happens like some that, that a judge says that. And so Dworkin would say that's evidence that, um, uh, that this distinction between legal reasoning and judicial decision-making is an illusory one. Um, I think that that's being naive um, in the sense that like, we all know that judges are under this huge constraint 
um, uh, in at least in the United States um, uh, uh, about making sure that they're not call, uh, not engaged in judicial activism, that they're not legislating from the bench. So they can kind of come out and say, well, actually philosophers have distinguished between judicial decision-making and legal reasoning, and the law does run out, has a heart showed, blah, 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 open tax. It's just uh, politically impossible. Um, and so I think that's the case. And let me just say one thing about the criticisms of me. Um, like, there, <laughs> Here's also about how I how I like wrote the book. There's a saying that goes, "You don't convince your colleagues; you convince your students." Um, and the idea is is that like their job is to disagree with you. Okay, their job is to, and they have their view, and you have your view, and you know it's a fight to the death. Um, but like you're never going to convince them because they're already committed, okay? I mean, not you'll never convince them, but it's rare to convince them, okay? What you really wanna do is go over their heads to the next generation. Um, that's what you're trying to do. Um, and that's what I tried to do when I wrote the book. And I think one of the, um, one of the great accomplishments of the concept of law is its style and who it was written for. It was written for students and therefore he got the students and you know i'm no i'm not hla hard so i i can never do what he did but i was mimicking that kind of strategy um so i just want to say like when you read critiques of views you know obviously evaluate them on their merits but that's just the game you know i remember when i handed in um, um, the day I handed in legality, you know, like a press send, um, and it sent, it got sent off to the press. I was really like, so worried, like there were mistakes in there and I didn't know what they were. And I was walking in, I saw my colleague, Bruce Sackerman, and he goes, and we were walking to the faculty lounge, uh, both to get coffee. And he said, why do you look so glum? And I said, oh, I just handed in my, um, my manuscript, my book manuscript, and I feel like I'm going to get criticized for mistakes that I made, but I don't know what those mistakes are. And he responded, he put his arm around me and he said, Scott, I have some news for you. When you publish a book, there are only two responses you get. You get criticized or you get ignored. 99% of all books are ignored. What you want is to be criticized. That's and I thought, what a shitty, what a shitty job. Like the best you could ever hope for is somebody like showing how you were wrong in front of everyone. Um, you know, like, oh, okay, nobody showed that I was wrong in front of everyone, but they ignored what I was saying. It just seems like 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 bad and worse. <laughs> but but like but after a while, you know, um, you know, you get I wouldn't say you get used to it, but you kind of know that it's part of the game. And I would say that, um, you know, the best way to get over being criticized is write something new, just to <laughs> kind of distract them, you know, get them onto something else. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so when you're talking about like critique and the reception of book, you're wondering that firstly, how has the reception been um, like according to you? That's the first thing. And second is like, are there critiques of the book which you agree with and which you think that you would have probably thought of differently if those critiques would have come like earlier? Yeah, so I would say, um, so the book was, I think, reviewed over 80 times. And I was shocked by that, like every, like, like the book was just like, it was just an absurd thing, just like review after review after review. Um, so like it was, I was numbing after a while, like I was just in like another review. Um, and I felt like, um, you feel, I feel like how authors often feel, like they were misunderstood, um, that a lot of the critiques were unfair, that, um, you know, 
uh, their people were trying to protect their turf. And, all, you know, those were like my initial reactions to things, which are just the natural reaction you have to be criticized in public. Um, and thank God I got more than like three reviews. Like, cause like if you get three reviews, like each review really matters. And if you get like a bad review, but two good reviews, you're only gonna remember the bad review. And so, and if you get like three reviews and two of them are bad, then you're gonna like be really upset. Um, and then you get three reviews and they're really good. And then you're like, why did I only get three good reviews? So like, you don't want three reviews, right? You want like 80, because after a while you just don't care anymore. Um, that's at least how I, that's at least how I dealt with it. Um, uh, so, um, that was the first, uh, you had a second part to it. Uh, what was the second part? Uh, um, that what are the critiques which you agree with and now oh, back, you think if you I, know about them? I swear, not one of them. I, 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 swear I, 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 and it, it's not a good thing. I mean, it, it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing because like, I don't know where to go from here. Like I wrote the damn thing. And like, I am not sure I have anything more to say about that, about what I wrote about. Um, I can't say that there was anything with that would have caused me to write the book differently. Um, uh, I was, um, the last thing I ever wanted to do was like write the planning theory of international law, the planning theory of administrative law. I was really interested in doing something completely different. Um, just because, you know, you, you don't talk about something different, you know, after a while. And that's one of the strange things. So if you spend 10 years writing a book, you've already thought it. But then like it gets, it takes a year for it to come out and it comes out, people read it, and then the reviews come in and you're like, you're already thinking about something else. And so for, 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 for people, it's like a new thing, but for you, it's like, I've been there, done that. Don't want to talk about it anymore. I want to talk about the new thing that I'm working on. So it's a very strange process, um, writing a book, um, and then being criticized in public, um, for it. Um, it's, it, it requires um, a really, um, it requires a real thick skin. It's, 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 it's hard. It really is hard to be criticized in public. Um, so, um, you know, uh, yeah, I would just say like, it, like if you, if you're, if, if you're out there and you write something and you're criticized and you like feel really bad about it, like get in line, you know, we all feel it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's often blood sport. I just wanted to ask uh, one question and then probably we can move to audience questions. Um, actually, I wanted to ask about a wicked legal system, which you have spoken about and uh, David Eisenhorst has written about it. And um, uh, David uh, Dysonhaus has said that unlike your presupposition that natural law rules out the possibility of evil legal system, they actually don't. And he says that the natural law legal, uh, natural law system does not rule out the possibility of evil legal, uh, sorry, evil, uh, legal systems. Rather, they focus on what is wrong with such systems. Legally uh, speaking, do you agree with the sp uh, agree with the same? Or and also, if you could explain uh, for people who haven't read the book. What do you mean by wicked legal systems? And if you could also give some examples and how does it affect the overall understanding of law for a positivist? Yeah, I, I think like virtually every legal system in history has been wicked. I mean, some has been unbelievably wicked. <laughs> you know, I mean, slavery, um, like, you know, mass uh, public executions for stealing bread. I, I mean, you know, like, um, you know, routine ethnic uh, discrimination, religious discrimination. I mean, like the law generally has been horrible <laughs> for, for most of human history. I mean, it has, it's had some great 
um, benefits. Um, uh, you know, I mean, it's good to have legal systems. It's probably worse not to have a legal system in many cases, but there've been like really wicked legal systems. And I just have never been able to get over the fact that um, how in the world are you supposed to understand a legal system as like, if you're a natural lawyer, you think that legal facts ultimately are determined by moral facts. What moral facts would ever justify the owning of a human being? Um, I just can't, I just, so that in, in part, it's like why I'm a positive, in part why I'm a positivist who believes that the law ultimately depends on social facts, not moral facts, because there are, there have been like, maybe most of them have been unjustifiable systems. Um, and yet they had law. Um, here's, a, here's another way to kind of get at like what's wrong with the natural law approach. So, you know, people have, been, let's say you're skeptical about morality. So many people are skeptical about morality, like philosophically skeptical, right? They think, you know, it's just me, you know, like, why is it, why is slavery wrong? Well, we've all agreed that slavery is wrong. There's like, no, no fact of the matter. You know, the only facts that are, exist are, you know, physical, physical facts, uh, facts about the physical world. There are no such thing as moral facts. They're kind of expressions of attitudes um, that uh, people have, um, uh, that their, their, their feelings, their emotions. Um, uh, and so a lot of people think, you know, legal facts can't rest on morality because there's no such thing as objective morality. Okay, now I happen not to be a moral skeptic. Okay, but think of it like this, okay? Nobody has ever been a skeptic about the law. Nobody has ever said, well, maybe law doesn't exist. You know, like everyone thinks that law has exists, right? So you, you can't, nobody is ever tempted to be a legal skeptic, but people are tempted to be moral skeptics. So that kind of, I think that's a good evidence that the two are not connected <laughs> because how could you be skeptical about the existence of one thing and say that this other thing depends on it, but you're not skeptical about the thing that, it, that depends on it. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so I, I kind of, I'm general, like I can't get over the fact that like the Nazis had law, the Romans had law, um, you know, um, you know, the Taliban has law, I mean, or had law, um, you know, they're just like really bad legal systems. And yet we are pretty confident they had law. Um, I think it's a very idiosyncratic view to think they didn't really have law. They had something law-like. I, I don't even get that. Yeah, I had a follow up to that, like um, very briefly. Then, like, in what cases do you determine whether it's a just or an unjust law? Like, like in the book, also you had written and you talk about that being a legal positivist doesn't mean that you justify, like, for example, like the Nazi regime or what happened in Stalin's era. So then, um, like, if you don't base that understanding of like just or unjust based on like your morality, then like, how do you determine that this is a law which you should not? Um, like believe in and try to change? No, so I believe that morality matters greatly to whether you should obey the law. I just deny that it matters for what it is you're supposed to obey, okay? So the idea is that like, we have this thing called law and what it is doesn't depend on morality. But of course, morality plays a role both at the beginning and at the end, it's the thing that hopefully legislators and lawmakers have used in order to figure out what the law should be. And then it's a de determining like me as a citizen, me as a judge, should I even do what the law tells me to do? That's also a moral question. But the question about what the law is, that is not a moral question. So it's of course, ma morality matters greatly to the law. 
And it doesn't, people, the problem is, is that people don't think it matters enough. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, and one of the things I think positivists were trying to do is they were trying to say, just because the law depends on social facts alone doesn't mean morality doesn't matter. Of course it does, but it's a separate question. And a lot of the positivists thought that they were engaged in kind of a conceptual hygiene, kind of distinguishing between law and morality so that people could make the right moral choices. Um, so, and I, I, I'm a believer in that. That's not the way I justify um, uh, positivism, but I think that that's right. Just to, just to like ask this quick question, um, just to what Umang said. Uh, so if uh, Schmidt says, or Carl Schmidt, when re he reads about emergence, he's also talking about the void of law. And similarly, a Gambon is also speaking about the void of law. So you would disagree with both of them because you would say that there is something, there is law, it's not law-like. Or maybe- Oh, oh uh, no, no, no. So, so uh, first of all, so I think, I mean, uh, I don't know what I think about this, but I just want to be clear about what Schmidt's view is. So I think Schmidt is Dworkin. I mean, Dworkin is Schmidt. Um, that is like what, 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 and not in terms of their politics, obviously. Dworkin was a liberal and of course, Carl Schmidt was famous illiberal. Um, but I think their jurisprudential theories were, were extremely similar. Um, and so the idea that Schmidt had was, is that, so famously he said in chapter, the beginning of chapter three of political theology, the sovereign is he who decides on the exception. And what did he mean by that? What he meant was, is that like, you know, in ordinary life, we don't see that the sovereign really has control over things because we're, we're kind of, we're, 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 we're living in normal times. But if you lived in abnormal times, you lived in conditions of emergency, you would see that there was always a kind of um, carve out. There was always an exception to every rule, okay? It basically is like, you need two witnesses to validate a will, comma, unless, there's an emergency, <laughs> you know, like, so there's like a defeasibility um, condition inserted into every legal norm, according to, according to um, Schmidt. And he also thought that this exception is itself not determined by law, okay? Um, it's the sovereign who decides. And how does the sovereign do it? He, he she, they, decides, well, that's what, that's the decisionism. Like here, here's, here's partly one way of thinking about it. Like say you're in the supermarket and there's like different boxes of cereal, you know, you just pick one, you know, how'd you do it? Well, you picked it. I mean, there's a way in which that's kind of Schmidt's view too. There are complications of course, but, but the idea is like, there's the, the sovereign kind of run out of, of material to make their decision. So have to rely on, you know, their, 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 their own sense of what should happen. Now, Kelson, this is like something that Kelson felt was just intolerable. The idea that you run out of norms seemed to be like something he, he just couldn't abide by. And uh, I'm telling you, I find Schmidt really interesting because I don't know what I think about it. I think it's a really um, complex question. Um, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not a Schmidtian, um, uh, but you know, the thing about Schmidt is he really challenges you to come up with um, a story to tell yourself and, um, and challenging Kelson to explain how there, it could be norms all the way down. Um, and so, um, yeah. Uh, um, okay, so moving on, we, we have this one question which we um, like, like to ask everyone. So because we are a book club, 
Um, so we ask all our guests for lots of book recommendations, like anything which they've read, found interesting, things which have like shaped their thinking. So, um, so what are the book recommendations you would like to give? Like it could be anything, fiction, non-fiction, academic books, non-academic books. And we have um, just to add like lots of questions also in the chat, which is about like if somebody is wanting to try um, reading philosophy or something, somebody is just started like reading this by themselves, what are the kind of books you would recommend? So if you could answer like both. Yeah, sure. Um, so that's a real, that's, a, I mean, it's a great question. Um, uh, you know, like what, what do I think are really important books to read? I, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I only know that the, I, I can only tell you like the books that I've read that have really influenced me, okay? Um, um, but, but that, I'm just like, a, I'm, I, I just have my own interests. I don't have other people's interests, so I don't know, but I will, I, I, I let me just type this in. I've said this before. I, I really, uh, I'll just type it into the, um, uh, Michael Bratman intention plans and practical reason. I just think that like, I read this in the 1980s and it's just, Still, I mean, I, I, I never, I never not think about it. Um, I mean, you can see the planning theory. I mean, M Michael Brotman developed what's called the planning theory of intention. It of course plays a big role in legality. Um, he has been extraordinarily influential um, uh, for, for, me, um, you know, like what books were really influential to me? I, I know I read a theory of justice a million times. I read the concept of law a million times. You know, I read, um, you know, I read Quine stuff over and over again. I mean, I was really, I really, um, uh, I read the classics, like the classics of contemporary analytical philosophy. Um, I don't read fiction. Uh, sorry about that. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't read fiction. My, my wife thinks that's crazy. Um, uh, but I just don't, I <laughs> want, want, want to, want to realize that you've been listening to a crazy person for two hours. I'll tell you why I don't like read fiction. Um, well, cause it didn't happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just stupid to say, but I just, I don't know. I just like not, I like, like learning things. Um, uh, and I know, I know people will say you can learn things from fiction. I know, I know, but I actually don't find human beings that interesting. You know, people say, oh, I find really interesting, you know, the fiction, you learn about people's thought processes and stuff like that. I don't, I don't care about that. Um, so, um, you know, great books, Seeing Like a State by um, James Scott. Great great book, Sing Like a State. Um, he's a political scientist, anthropologist, um, uh, who uh, um, wrote about the rise of the state and the way in which the state had to organize knowledge, not for the purposes of being able to regulate who was in there. So like in the 18th century, you get the rise of census taking, people starting to count how many people were in their state and the reason why they count who's in their state is because they know have to know who to tax um so that was like an amazingly important um book for me uh um, the most recent book that i've read which i've loved i'll type it in the chat um it's called the industry of anonymity by jonathan lusthouse it's a fantastic book about the um, about the organization of cyber criminal industry. Um, it's super interesting, not only from like the perspective of cyber crime, um, but also um, from the perspective of um, of uh, of like what would the world look like in the state of nature um, when he what what he's trying to do is he's trying to figure out how do cyber criminals cooperate in an anonymous world? You need to know who you're dealing with in order to cooperate, but how do you do that if everyone's anonymous? So like an anonymity is really good 
um, if you're a cyber criminal, because then the law enforcement can't catch you. But how do you get other people to cooperate with you to do your cyber criminal conspiracies if they can't identify you either? So I think that was a fantastic book. You want to do it I like it. Let, let, oh, excuse me. Let, here we go. So here. These are these are the book. These are my books. Like, can you see that? Yeah, yeah. Can you guys see? Yeah. So I just like you said. I just I just these are the books that I've been reading now. They're just um, they're like manuals, and then they're like I I, I tend to be very um, um, very project oriented. Um, I read everything. about the subject that I'm interested in to a normal human being, like what they should read, because I'm not, I, I'm very goal directed in my reading. I'm sorry about that. I know that was like a huge, that was possibly the worst question a book club, that was possibly the worst book club answer ever given. Oh no, this was actually like quite insightful. Like, uh, some of these books like we'd also had heard of before and like we'll definitely like take this up and like read um so so i'm just like going through the audience questions and i'm like collating um whatever questions are there so so like one question which everyone's been asking is are there more episodes of your jurisprudence podcast coming one and second when is your uh, cyber law book coming out uh, oh yeah so it's a, there there are more episodes um, I was actually thinking of doing one yesterday, um, but then I got caught up. Um, um, but I do, I, I do plan to do um, more more episodes because they're kind of, they're really fun. I, I really enjoy doing it. Um, but I was just I stopped. So the reason why I did the podcast in part was because I was. What happened was when the pandemic started, I spent all I did was write my cyber security book. And I was just like, I was, I missed philosophy. And so I thought, oh, if I do a pot, if I teach this course, I do a podcast, I could talk philosophy. Though, of course, I was just talking into my, like, like, literally, this was the first, <laughs> the first episode. I was, just, I was just talking into my iPad, which is amazing. Uh, I was actually right here. I was just talking to my iPad and I just sent it, you know, you just press click and like, <laughs> suddenly, you know, your, 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 your ramblings become um, immortal. Um, uh, so I bet I do plan to do it. The book, I finished it. Um, I finished writing the book in, uh, June 15th and I sent it to my editor. And um, because this is a trade book, it will get multiple rounds of editing. So it takes a while for this book to come out because it gets edited. So there's a between academic books and trade books is an academic books never are never edited. You get an academic book, you send it to the press. So like legality was never edited. You know, it was like copy edited a little bit, you know, like, you know, did you mean a semicolon? But like, it was just basically what I wrote. The internationalist like was extensively edited. Um, and the same thing will be for this next book. So I, I think people have like the wrong impression about um, academic writing versus trade writing. It's really changed. Um, there's no more editing anymore for academic writing. And there's actually limitations on how many footnotes you can put in on academic books. Whereas in trade books, um, like our, our Simon and Schuster, my publisher was just, uh, was like, you know, we had 130 pages of endnotes, which is something that no, no academic press would allow. Um, I shouldn't say no academic press, but they, they, they really, they don't like it. Number one, but number two is, I have found that the, um, that the writing is so much better because you have these professional editors constantly pushing you to be clearer and clearer and answer more questions. And contrary to what people think, which is they, they, often, they often say, um, well, you know, if you write a trade book, you have to dumb down your ideas. I have found it completely the opposite. I have found that um, uh, when writing a, a trade book, 
I am constantly being pushed to be more academic, more scholarly, uh, clearer, answer more questions, justify myself more um, than, an ac than an academic writing at all. So I really like trade publishing because it's, I think, a much better publishing experience, much better writing experience. So maybe the book will come out in a year, hopefully, but that's just the process. Okay, um, and there are lots of questions about um, the content of the book in terms of some clarification about the theory. But like before that, like there's one question which people have asked that can we email you about uh, like whatever we want to ask you about your book and would that be something which like you would be open to? Are you asking me is there something I'd like to say about the book? Um, no, no. So people are asking that can they email you to... Um, like oh, oh, yeah, questions it, about the book. Yeah, I it, it just it it just I, I'm I'm going to Las Vegas for a week because there's a um there's cyber there's Black Hat and Def Con so they may may take a while to get response but yes um it's just that I'm I'm traveling for the next week so it'll be yeah um but yes of course. Um, okay, great. Also, there were a couple of people who were um, asking that they've just started like either their law student life or they've graduated. So in that, like looking back, would you have like a couple of things which you'd, which you think you, if you'd have known like earlier, you'd want like people to, you'd want like other people to take um, notice of the fact or like would learn from that? Oh, you mean, what, what do I think they should be concentrating in or um, in, in yeah. law school as a law student? Yeah, in terms of like general advice, like there are also like um, academics who started or who just like graduated. So they're asking in terms of like, if there's any advice which you would have from your years of experience, something which you um, yeah. learned later. Oh, I mean like, uh, that is like, do I have general wisdom um, for, <laughs> for, for the, yeah, okay, um, um, no. Um, I have no, I have no, I have no wisdom. <laughs> I, I, I don't, do, I don't do wisdom. Um, I do snark. Um, no, I, I'm, so one of the things I tell, I mean, I have, I, I'm, I, I have lots of advice that I give to people, but it really depends on the context. So like, I, I'm, I'm really, I, I, I love mentoring students. I love working closely with students it's like that's the that's that's the real fun part of the job um you know like bringing them along but one of the things that you gotta do is you gotta know that person um because like it's a complicated like life is complicated and they have they have their talents they have their interests they have their family they have their friends they have like their backgrounds they have just so many things and you just don't know like so so um you know people you know um lots of times like the admissions officers will call me up and they'll say can you call this person and try to convince them to come to yale and i i always say to the admission people i may not say they should go to yale you know um, because they, it may not be the right place for them. Um, it really depends. I would say that one of the big mistakes I think academics make, um, I should say, one of the big mistakes I think philosophers make when they go to law school is they don't take enough law. Now, like when, when PhD students in philosophy come to me at the beginning of law school and they go, what should I take? I say tax, bankruptcy, corporate law, property, you know, like all the basics, you know, I mean, I'm not sure bankruptcy is basic, but, you know, I mean, I took commercial law, I took bankruptcy, I took all these black letter courses, because I thought like, you're in law school, learn the goddamn law, you know, if you're in law school, don't do philosophy, go to philosophy to do philosophy, you know, um, and so uh, despite the fact that I myself, um, don't care what the law is um, in my life. Um, I sure as hell care about what it is when A, I teach it, and B, when I was a student, because 
like, what are you going to philosophize about if you don't know what it is that you're doing? Um, so I think a big mistake that theoretically minded people do is that they ignore the practical. Um, and one of the things that I do, you know, I, I run a legal clinic at, at Yale. Like I do legal stuff. Um, I, um, as part of the documentary film project, um, I founded and I run this, um, uh, this clinic where we provide legal advice to documentary filmmakers um, uh, as part of like, as a way of protecting them because they tend not to have um, the funds in order to get legal services. So that's what we do. And I, so I, I actually am the big believer um, in academics and theorists getting their hands dirty um, and doing legal work um, just to like be in the mix. It's also true that like nobody wants to do philosophy 24 seven, you know, you want to mix it up, you know, like, you know, it's like, it's kind of fun doing different things. So that, that, that's what I would say, you know, learn the law, maybe practice some law um, uh, and read a lot. Okay, I'm just going through the questions and seeing like which one we could take because there are lots of questions here. Um, like one question which is there, which I think like we have talked about also, but like has been something which was there like in the YouTube comments also, like and here also is that how um, like in your experience, you think like philosophical arguments generally can be introduced in a much more like convincing way to people. Because like, I'm guessing you must have been asked like this question a lot, like why should we care? And like over the years, there might have been some like response, which you must have, which like really hits the core. So in that, like how, um, like what is your answer to this when people ask that, how can like philosophical arguments be introduced to people in a more convincing way so that they uh, take it more seriously? And I was like saying to people, how do you teach linear algebra in a more convincing way? I mean, there's like, there's like a limit, you know, it's like hard, um, you know, it's like, don't like, just because we can all philosophize doesn't mean that we like can, can go along and follow the argument long enough to actually get the point. It's like, um, you know, it's like, it's like I play guitar. You know, it's like, how can you make learning guitar simpler? Well, people try to learn, make guitar simpler. They come up with different systems, mnemonics, you know, exercises, things like that. But ultimately, like, give somebody a guitar, they're not, it's going to sound like shit for a couple of years. Um, <laughs> it's hard. Um, and so there's just like a limit to the nature of how, much you can simplify a really hard, complicated question, a set of questions. So I tried my best in legality. Sorry, it's New York. Um, uh, I, I try. Um, I try my best. I try my best in legality. Write something that anybody can understand. Like so, I don't use the word epistemological. I don't. You like every word is a, every term is explained, um, and. Um, you know, that's the best you can do. And then ultimately, if somebody says, I didn't understand chapter, like after chapter 10, and they say, well, you know, maybe I could have done a better job, but maybe you should read it again. You know, just like if somebody says, I can't do this bar chord, you say, well, give it some time, you know, that's just the way it is. Yeah, so it's um, like it's 10 according to Indian standard time. And um, like if you have a couple of more minutes, we can go through some more questions. Otherwise, we can uh, like do it. If you have I, the time, then I have I have the time. But, you know, I, I don't know. Is that like the polite way of saying we would like to end this or is that no, no. <laughs> okay. I, like it's I, a I, genuine question? OK, no, I, I, then my legitimate answer is I have time. Okay, great. Uh, so, Sonali, you want to do the rapid fire? We we have prepared like a couple of 
questions which are generally like just fun and we'd like to answer um that so so do you want to go ahead and do that sonali um, yeah, if you it. want you can drink some water before that i think because these are going to be yeah, tough you know so i i i You know what I did? I when I got up, I kicked it over. So I I, I was oh, saying how yeah. like I got a thing of water, but I've never drank water in my in in any talk I've ever been at. Um, uh, oh, it's you. just a it's just a prop, and and I and, and I just kicked it over, so I can't even drink it if I wanted. Um, okay, I'll ask. You can take. Uh, it's called rapid fire, where you can take as much time you want to. Um, uh, who's Uh, legal system or uh, evil legal system? Do you think is the best, uh, U.S. or North Korea? Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. North Korea or what? Or U.S. Or the U.S. Oh, w- which has a more wicked system? Okay, I know that this is going to be considered um, parochial, and um, but I'm going to say the American legal system is better than the North Korean system. Maleficent. Was that was, was that the right answer? I don't know. Like we we're going by your answer. Oh, What okay, okay. Answer? And uh, unless if it's not, we'll just see. Uh, if they okay. to land or to touch the space orbital, um, would you rather travel with Branson or Bezos? <laughs> so I was just actually talking about this. Last night, I was. We had a my sister at a birthday party. And we were talking about family. It's like I, I don't care to go to space. So I just want to say that I don't care to go to space. I don't want to paint people like that's not like a thing of mine. Um, but um, Jeff Bezos, I think, is a uniquely um, I want to say it. Um, well, let me just tell you. This is my image of Jeff Bezos. Okay, like him alone in his um, in his living room, stacking gold coins on his coffee table. Um, like, is it like the, the idea of like just amassing money? like you know like billions and billions of dollars for what purpose i mean um in a world of crushing and morally odious inequality is just monstrous to me um um branson is just gross um like I, he just kind of grosses me out Um, so that's a tough one, but I don't think I could be in the same space as Bezos, um, uh, just like from a moral perspective. Um, I, I just think this is a grotesque thing. If you invite any philosopher to dinner, who would that be? Dead or living? Oh, that's such a great question. That's a great question. Who would it be? I mean, I guess you'd have to. Oh, wow. So, who are the best philosophers? Okay, <laughs> so let's go through the best philosophers. Okay, Socrates, Plato. Let's just say they're one. You know, but Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Hume, Kant. No, that's it. Yeah, Hume, Kant, Aristotle, Plato. Maybe. Yeah. Um, they're they're like they're like. As far as I know, I mean, I'm sure. I like again in the Western philosophical tradition, I am ignorant of other traditions. I think if I had to have, um, I think, I think just in terms of pure brain power and fun, maybe Aristotle. Um, you know, he knew so much, and he 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 just like you probably would get like. A crisp answer from him, whereas like with, like if you got Socrates over, you know, you'd ask him a question and he'd ask you a question back, and it would just be a nightmare. Um, Hume, 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 be a lot of fun because he was like a really fun, but like I feel like you can learn what you want to learn from his um, from his uh, books, um, 
And then finally, I would say um, Kant, you know, uh, uh, my, my wife told me this, um, there, are, there are all these articles about, like he was really interested in dinner parties and he's, he's, he wrote a lot about uh, how to have a good dinner party. Um, so he might be good, um, Kant, but he just does seem like you really have to be a Kantian to really kind of enjoy that. So um, I think probably Aristotle, but the one person I would, if I had to pick one person ever to have dinner with, I think it would be probably be Moses. I mean, I don't think Moses existed, but if he were to have existed, I would have liked to. Like, why did you, like, why did you throw the tablets? Were you really pissed off about the, about the golden calf? You know, like, did you really believe that the rod was going to split the water? You know, the sea. I, I'd love to ask him those questions. Which of the sixteen thirteen? Which which of the which what's your favorite rule in the bible what's your least favorite rule in the bible that would be like a lot of fun you could uh, have your own last supper or something of that sort <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah so uh, if there's um like only one book which you're allowed to now read over and over again um like any one legal philosophy book which one would that be yeah the, uh, it, only in legal philosophy um yeah or like any book which you could only like there's only one book now which you can read over and over again for the rest of your life i guess i would say probably critique of pure reason um just because like you wouldn't get bo- i mean y- y- there's just so much in it and it raises so many questions that you would spend this enormous amount of your time trying to figure out what he said um and that would be like really interesting um, and also he's like talking about basic things about space and time and concepts and knowledge and experience, you know, like, you're not going to think like, oh, like I'm bored of knowledge or like I'm bored of the nature of reality, you know, um, you know, you'd be like, yeah. so I would think it would probably be critique of pure reason. Okay. Um, is there any book which after reading you felt that, oh God, I wish I had written this book. You wish you had written the book? Yeah. That I wish. Yeah. Well, every book that I write is a book that I wish that somebody had written, but nobody did. That's why I had to write it. So I just say that's like that's the that's the, that is really like if somebody had written legality, you know, in that I wouldn't have I wouldn't have written it because it would you know. So I often write things that um, like I'm really interested in, and I can't find the book. um on it there are books that whose sheer brilliance um so i would say that what i what motivates me so much well i the highest compliment i can give you give you give anyone is that like you're so good you make me feel bad about myself um and there's so many books like that that i read and it just makes me feel so bad about myself because it's so goddamn smart um uh and i can't even i mean there's so many books like that that i just make me feel inadequate um uh that i can't even like i don't know like uh, you know the concept of law is just just a brilliant book i really wish i had written that you know um uh but yeah that's that that's the how come i can't think of any books that i've ever read now it's like it's like i, I do read books i like actually i don't read books anymore i listen to books i it turns out i can listen to things much faster than i can read so i mm-hmm. i i listen so i listen to books and i convert all my articles to to voice and i listen to them at on like three times speed because i can okay. I, 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 yeah so okay um the next question is if not an academic what would you like to be a malware anal- uh, analyst okay i thought you were just going to say malware that's why i started laughing but oh, okay um, no 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 that makes that, sense yeah. I, yeah i would like to be if i was not an academic i think i would love to have been like a malware analyst that seems like okay. a lot of fun um uh, i i i i did coding 
for many for many years before I did philosophy, and I really like it, and I've kind of gotten back into it. Um, um, and I've been playing around with machine learning and and um, and just you know like you know new kinds of newfangled stuff, theorem provers, and things like that. I I, I it would probably be something in tech. Um, if I didn't do, uh, if I was an academic, though, I would just say that I'm an academic in part because I almost can't imagine any other job that I would be good at. And not that I'm good at it, being an academic, I just, but I, I don't think I, I, I mean, I, I just am temperamentally unsuited for most jobs. Okay. And, um, then last like rapid fire question, which we have is. Like, has anyone ever asked you if you're related to Ben Shapiro? A thousand times. <laughs> I mean, like, that's probably the most common question I get. So it's like, so just, so for people, right, like for people outside the coasts, like East Coast, West Coast, um, uh, we, uh, you know, the name Shapiro, like if you're on the East Coast or West Coast, the name Shapiro is like the name Smith, you know? There's just so many Shapiros. Um, um, you know, I, I remember when my, when my, uh, our second child um, is, is, is a boy. Um, and my father, when he heard it was a boy, um, said, oh, thank God, the name Shapiro will live on, which I thought was hysterical because like 17 pages of the New York phone book is Shapiro. Um, so like, the, 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 so, um, uh, it's a, such a very common name, Shapiro. Um, and no, um, uh, I am not related to, I, as far as I know of, I'm not related to Ben Shapiro. And, um, I don't understand why he's so popular and I'm not, uh, no, I just added that last part. Um, but, um, I just say like, he's just like, a, he's like a fool. Um, I don't really understand, um, like, wh you know, why everyone knows him. Um, but yes, I get asked that all the time. And no, I'm not related. Sometimes I tell him that, uh, yeah, sometimes I tell people that I'm his father, uh, which just kind of messes people up. But no, I'm not related to him. I mean, it's like asking why is Trump famous. So we do, we all have our reasons. Probably his Twitter game is better than yours. I'm sorry, what? So maybe his Twitter game is better than yours. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, oh, who's Twitter better? Um, uh, I mean, I, I don't actually follow him. Um, uh, I, I see, you know, sometimes it gets tweeted, uh, retweeted into my timeline. Um, but I'm not like trying to convince anybody of anything. Like, I, like, I just, I'm not, I just like, it just comes into my head. Um, uh, and I just like to get a laugh. You know, I, I'm, I'm like, I would, like, I will do anything to get a laugh. I will stand, I, like, I'll put a lampshade on my head. Um, like, I really will do anything to get a laugh. Um, and that's my main, that's, that's one of my, that's not one of my main weaknesses, but one of my weaknesses is that I just really, cheap laughs, fine with me. Um, so uh, um, the thing about Ben Shapiro is he's like trying to convince you of the truth of conservatism of some sort, but I'm not trying to convince you of the truth of liberalism. I just kind of assume it's true. Um, on Twitter, I mean, in, in, in academic writing, of course, I'm trying to convince people of lots of things and also trying to make them laugh. Um, yeah, so, so right now I'm frankly confused if there are a couple of more uh, questions in Q&A. Um, you want to take that or uh, you want to like, call it a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think we can take like one question last and then we can. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But I, I don't know which one to, um, uh, which one to pick. Um, uh, uh, um, 
So, mm-hmm. so the bunch. Uh, let me take the first one. Hi. Um, uh, you know what? Can I just say something? I can't read and think on the fly like this. I just can't. It, like um, that. That's like not one of my skills. So either um, somebody ask me the question, or I, or we should end it because I can't. I can't process it. I'm um, sure I'll read um, the questions. How do you want to read the first question or um, any question? Sure, read the first. Read the first question. Yeah. Remember, I told you like again, like I I listen to things rather than reading. That this is part of the thing. I, I I'm much more oral person um, or, oral person than visual. Okay. Um. So I'll read. The, uh, it says that hi, I'm Eduardo from Brazil, and thank you in advance so much. For the brilliant exposure you've given, Professor Shapiro. Um, then the question goes: that thinking about rules and plans and the chicken and the egg problem, is it possible to point out how to establish authority in a plan and define who can draw it, and at what historical moment this should happen? On the other hand, thinking of disconnection between jurisprudence and legal practice, the sociological approach to jurisprudence would be a viable alternative, such as what is proposed by Professor Brian. the manaha in a realistic theory of law so i think so it's a two part question there's another um, part to this that um is there any possibility i think this one you wanted about the podcast so um um i said so, yeah, so i yeah i will i will um uh i kind of ended it on a cliffhanger so that was part of the part of the see So like if I if I had wrapped it up, people would be like, oh, the podcast is over. So it's a, like I told you, every legal philosophy is all about marketing, you know. Um, so um, so um, so what is the ch- just briefly? What is the chicken egg problem? The chicken egg problem is like, how is law possible? So on the one hand, you need legal authority to make the laws. On the other hand, you need law to make legal authority. So like the the you know you need eggs. To ma- you need eggs to make chickens. You need chickens to make eggs. And so the question is: there is there a point in time that you can point? And so the so my response to the chicken egg problem is to think is to say that that we ground the law like you stop the infinite regress by the fact that human beings have the special capacity to form plans. And so, in, and not only that, not only do we have the 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 ability to to form plans, but we can form social plans. That is, we can form plans together, and that's an enormously interesting thing, right? So, even like if you think that certain animals can have intentions, like it's you know, it's a like a huge leap to be able to think that they can form like. Shared plans together. It's it's not clear that they can do that. Um, and so the claim is is that law comes into being as soon as you have enough people sharing a plan that um, is able to create um, efficacy about the plans which are validated by that shared plan. So the thing is, the moment in time is when people start listening. To this group and their plan, um, and that's the point in time I would claim. And so, let me just end this really fun session by just making a a claim about philosophical methodology. Um, and that is that I feel like when you're arguing about, let's say, the law, what you want to do is you want to relate it to something in life. Which is well, better understood than law, okay? Because if you can do that, people can gain purchase on what the phenomenon is because they understand this other phenomenon. So the claim is is that plan we plan all the time. We plan not only individually but we plan together. And so, like, you don't need to be a lawyer to make plans. And you don't need to be a lawyer in order to interpret plans, and so that kind of should give us some kind of sense about maybe if laws are plans, then ordinary people can think about the law 
in the way in which they think about other things in their life. So the idea is to make um, law continuous with activities that not only are well understood, but something that we do hundreds of times a day. And so that was like, that's the project. The project was to like introduce this idea of planning that we all understand generally well, and then say law is just like that, just much more sophisticated. Okay, so, um, so thank you so much for that answer and for taking out your time for this session also. I know that we've um, like passed what we'd initially discussed, but like, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. And this has been a really fun session and has given us like more insights about the book has given us, um, has made us like more curious to go and now like read more things about this and like other books also, which you recommended. So, so thank you so much for that. And for everyone who has like joined us today, either on Zoom or on YouTube, like thank you so much for attending this talk. If you enjoyed this, please do check out Professor Shapiro's book. We've linked it in the YouTube description. And um, like, if you enjoyed this talk and if you'd want to like read with us, then you can also join the book club. That link is also in the YouTube description. So, so yeah, so that brings us to the end. And I just, again, like want to thank you, um, Professor Shapiro for taking out this time. And this was really nice. Thank well, you. Thank you. Can you... I'm sorry, Sonali, go ahead. No, I was just saying that thank you for coming and thank you for telling me that uh, while making, uh, as in voting choices, I should make presentation and, uh, I think that is what I'm taking away with. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you. Can you ask me if I enjoyed myself? Yeah. So ask me, did you enjoy yourself? Did you enjoy it? <laughs> I did too. <laughs> thank yeah, you so, so much. I really enjoyed you guys. You guys were great. Thanks to everyone in the audience. Um, it was really fun. Thank you very much. Thank you.